Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, minash shaytan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wal udwani illa ala dhalimeen, wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. I think many of us would say in the last month and a half, you experience a sudden emotion of sadness that strikes you in the middle of a moment of joy and happiness. Meaning, subhanAllah, you might find yourself in a situation where you're enjoying something the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala programmed you to enjoy certain things. You're enjoying the company of family, you're enjoying the company of friends. You are smiling and then suddenly an image comes to your mind and you start to think about what is happening to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free them and give them victory. Allahumma ameen. And suddenly sadness overtakes you. And there's a term that I heard a few times and that I've thought about over the last month and a half called survivor's guilt. Now if you look up survivor's guilt, and I'm not going to give you an overly technical term because the term is actually pretty self-explanatory, right? It switches the why me paradigm to why them. Meaning subhanAllah, before October 7th, I think that a lot of people would have been asking questions about why are certain things happening to them, and maybe that was causing them sadness. But now, a lot of us are looking towards what is happening to our brothers and sisters and thinking, why is this pain being inflicted upon them and not me? And the why here can come from a place of doubt, doubting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that, or it can come from a place of why me, as in what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expect of me? Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not tested me the way that he's tested those people? And I wanted to actually read into the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the companions with this concept that is being spoken about so often now, survivor's guilt. And I want to begin with the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa years after the Battle of Uhud. Now SubhanAllah, we just came back from Umrah and it was very emotional to visit Uhud because it's so relevant to the moment that we are in right now. And every single companion that lived or touched Uhud in some way, whether they were present on the battlefield or they lost someone in the battlefield of Uhud, whether they saw the scenes themselves or the scenes were described to them, decades later, when Islam was victorious, and they started to see some of the goodness of this world that their companions at Uhud did not see, they would reflect on that. And so you find multiple narrations that have to do with this. One of them is a narration of Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we know who Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu is. He's a man who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with ease and comfort and wealth before Islam, during Islam, and after Islam. Throughout his entire life radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he generally lived a life of great wealth and a life of great comfort. And he is one of Al-Ashr Mubashireen, one of the 10 promised paradise, precisely because he wasn't distracted from his pursuit of paradise by the doors of this dunya that were opened up to him. And one day, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu is eating, and suddenly in the middle of his food, in the middle of his meal, as the narration says, and this is in Bukhari, he starts to weep. So again, sometimes it hits you at a random moment. This is years later, and in the middle of a meal, suddenly he starts to weep. Now Allah opens up the doors of khayr, of goodness to Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu all the time. But at that moment, subhanAllah, it just clicked. And as he starts to weep, the people around him are wondering what caused him to cry. So he says, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, qutila mus'ab. Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was murdered. وَكَانَ خَيْرًا minni, And Mus'ab was better than me. Mus'ab was murdered and Mus'ab was better than me. I want you to pay very close attention to the sentiments, not just the sadness, the sentiment that is being conveyed. Mus'ab radiallahu anhu was murdered and Mus'ab was better than me. فَلَمْ يُوجَدْ لَهُ مَا يُكَفَّنُ فِيهِ إِلَّا burda. And the only thing that we could find to cover him on the day of Uhud after he was martyred was one cloth. If we covered the top of him, 
then his bottom was exposed, and if we covered the bottom, then his top was exposed. Then he said, وَقُتِلَ Hamza," And Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu was martyred. وَكَانَ خَيْرًا minni," And he was better than me. فَلَمْ يُوجَدْ لَهُ مَا يُكَفَّنُ فِيهِ إِلَّا burda." And the only thing we had to cover Hamza radiallahu anhu with was one single garment. Now here's where it all comes full circle to him and what's on his mind as he is thinking about how some of his companions who he deems better than him did not have the circumstances that he has in this dunya and on top of that were murdered in gruesome ways. He says, لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ أَنْ يَكُونَ قَدْ عُجِّلَتْ لَنَا طَيِّبَاتُنَا فِي حَيَاتِنَا الدُّنْيَا I'm afraid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hastened our blessings in this life of ours. And then he started to weep once again. And so his sadness contains multiple components. The guilt contains multiple components. Number one, Mus'ab and Hamza are better than me and they were killed in a way that I was not killed. Number two, I lived to witness the wealth of this world and they did not even have a garment to, to cover themselves at the time of their death. Number three, I'm afraid that perhaps this is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up the doors of this world to us, has hastened the blessings of this world to us, and we will be amongst the deprived in the hereafter, whereas they have been deprived in this world, and they have gone ahead to the blessings in the hereafter. This is, of course, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in multiple places in the Qur'an. سَنَسْتَدْرِجُهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ that we will delay them and we will pull them in from directions that they do not anticipate. The day that the disbelievers are presented to their punishment, to their chastisement, and it is said to them, did you already waste, did you already consume all of your goodness in that passing life of yours and find pleasure in that and today find nothing but the effects of the evil that you put forth in this world. And so there's a fear that even someone like Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu has. Compare that, subhanAllah, to Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu in a very similar situation. Now, before I get to the very similar situation with Khabab, let's go to the most famous incident of Khabab radiallahu ta'ala anhu years earlier when he was with the Prophet sallallahu and he is one of the most tortured companions. And so there was a time when other people looked at Khabbab and felt sorry for him and said, how come we are spared and a man like Khabbab is tortured? There was a time where you were on the outside looking in and you saw the master of Khabbab putting him through all sorts of torture and terror and wondering, Ya Allah, this man is so good. What did he do to deserve this and why is he going through this and how come I get to comfortably walk the streets of Mecca? And I am not tortured the way that Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is. And Khabbab says, I came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam while he was leaning his back against the Kaaba and he was extending his legs. And I went to him alayhi salatu wasalam and I said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Ala tad'ullah? This is the actual words. Ala tad'ullah? Imagine saying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, aren't you going to make dua to Allah? Ala tad'ullah. Does anyone in here think for a moment that the Prophet ﷺ was not making dua for his ummah? The man who would go into sujood for so long, alayhi salatu was salam, ummati, ummati, that you would think he was dead, crying for his ummah? But this is human, this is real, this is in the midst of great torture, in the midst of great torment. And so when he goes to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ala tad'ullah. As if to say, you look a little too calm for the circumstances, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is where he says, فَقَعْدَ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَهُوَ مُحْمَرٌ وَجْهُهُ That the Prophet Sallallahu sat up and his face became red. He sat up and his face became red. And he said, لَقَدْ كَانَ مَنْ قَبْلَكُمْ لَيُنْشَطُ بِمِشَاطِ الْحَدِيدِ مَا دُونَ عِظَامِهِ مِنْ لَحْمٍ أَوْ عَصَبٍ he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that there were people that came before you and they used to be combed with iron combs 
until all of the meat, all of the flesh was taken off of their bodies, leaving only their bones exposed. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَيُوضَعُ الْمِنْشَارُ عَلَى مَفْرِقِ رَأْسِهِ فَيُشَقُّ بِثْنَتَيْنِ He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that in a person would be put into the ground and he would be cut into two. Prophet Sallallahu is getting very graphic. Now if you read the ahadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is not his habit, right? It's not his habit. I want you to ponder on the seerah and ponder on the circumstances a little bit closer. It wasn't the habit of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to talk about the nature, the graphic nature of the torture of people. Because the Prophet ﷺ used to have a message in which he would instill hope. He would talk about the Jannah that they went to, not the hell on earth that they were taken out of. And I use hell on earth because it's a term, but of course we know there's nothing comparable to hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, right? But he wouldn't talk about the circumstances that were here as much as he would talk about what they went to so that the Sahaba had ulu al himmah they had a higher ambition. But here the Prophet ﷺ is saying to Khabbab because Khabbab is looking around at that time in his life and Khabbab is the scary image. He's the one with no skin on his back. Why? Because his uh, master has taken burning hot coal and poured it down his back عنه, to where the skin has melted off of his back. So he's the graphic image that people look at and say, why? What's happening to him? But the Prophet ﷺ is giving him a very graphic image, even more than the one that he has suffered. There were, there were people who had every single part of their meat taken off of their bodies, that were sliced in the two. مَا يَصْرِفُهُ ذَلِكَ عَنْ دِينِهِ And none of that took that person away from his religion. None of that took that person away from his religion. They died upon faith even under the most grueling of torture. Now why do I mention this here? Because fast forward to Khabbab about 50 years later. About 50 years later, as we're approaching now the golden age of Islam. And Abi Wa'il radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Udna Khabbaba, that we went to visit Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and it's like he was sitting and reflecting. So he's talking to the tabi'een now who didn't live those days. They see a very different circumstance. They see Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he looks like he's doing okay for himself. Right? He's one of the elites of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The tabi'een adore him, the sahaba adore him. He's doing pretty well for himself now. And so we went to visit him and you sit down with Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Khabbab says, Hajarna ma Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nuridu wajhallah. I remember when we made hijrah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we were seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fawaqa'a ajruna ala Allah. And at that time, the reward that we had was certainly due upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning we knew that there was absolutely no worldly benefit for this moment that we were making hijrah. But we knew that we had the ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمِنَّا مَنْ مَضَى لَمْ يَأْخُذْ مِنْ أَجْرِهِ شَيْئًا He said, some of us died. Some of us died. Because he's speaking about the companions like a fraternity, like a brotherhood. Some of us passed away and they did not take any ajr, any of the goodness that this world had to offer. And he says, مِنْهُمْ مُسْعَبِ بْنُ عُمَيْرِ they always go back to Mus'ab. Why? Because Mus'ab radiallahu anhu had it all and he lost it all in front of their eyes. If you saw Mus'ab in Mecca and you saw Mus'ab on Uhud, you saw a man with everything in this world and then a man with nothing in this world radiallahu ta'ala anhu, only expecting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he expected. And he said that Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu went from this world and he took nothing from this dunya. And he, and he went and he said the same thing Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, that when we covered his head, his legs were exposed. And if we covered his bottom half, then his upper half was exposed. And he says, and at this point, وَمِنَّا مَنْ أَيْنَعَتْ لَهُ ثَمَرَتُهُ فَهُوَ يَهْدِبُهَا He says, and there are amongst us those who lived past that, and we've seen the fruits of our efforts in this dunya come to fruition. 
And he said that we are collecting those fruits right now. Almost to say, I'm afraid for myself because we lived past the most difficult moments and now we're very comfortable and we're wondering, subhanAllah, this is a man who used to be tortured so severely that everyone else looked at him in his torture and he's saying, we're wondering now if there is anything left for us to consume in the hereafter. So he went from, if you think about the paradigm shift, he went from being the one that everyone looked at and said, why is he going through this? And we're not going through it. To being someone who went on in life to now look at others in the same way that passed away before him. Which shows you, subhanAllah, that the circumstances can completely flip your perspective. And that is one of the wisdoms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making this life so unstable, so volatile, that one moment you feel like everything is great and the next moment you feel like everything has been taken away. There's a hikmah to that. There's the wisdom to that. Because it shifts your perspective in a certain way. Khabbab radiallahu anhu had the light of iman, faith in his heart the entire time, but now he's seeing things different because things are different for him right now. And so what is the survivor's guilt that's happening with the companions of the Prophet They saw if they live long enough, the best people go through the worst of things. Now what's the difference between their survivor's guilt and some of what you hear in the words of people right now? At no point in the undertones is there a questioning of whether or not Allah has been fair to those people. At no point is there a questioning of whether or not Allah has been fair to those people. In fact, there is a questioning of whether I have repaid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the place that I'm in right now. Whether I have responded in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tasked me to respond. There is a khair that I have. وَكُلًّا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَ And everyone will have their due. It's extremely painful to watch what's happening to our brothers and sisters. But بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Allah has customized the path to Jannah for them. We don't accuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of being unjust to them while fighting the cruelty of man towards them. Never do we accuse Allah of being unjust towards them. They have a path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them. For us, naturally, we should feel guilty. And how do you reconcile this? The same way the Prophet ﷺ reconciled when he lost Ibrahim, his son, and he felt sad, but at the same time he knew where his son was going The sadness was the natural part in the heart of holding your dead child. The certainty was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would embrace that child in a way that the Prophet ﷺ could never do himself, that no human being could give to that child. And so the sadness, when we see our brothers and sisters in Gaza, and then we compare ourselves and we say, SubhanAllah, what am I doing here? Why, you know, why is all of this open towards me? I'm so comfortable here. I could have easily been in their situation. Why me in the sense of the khair, the goodness that's coming to me and the, and the hardship that's coming to them? But you flip that and you think to yourself instead, what's the responsibility? Now, SubhanAllah, you look through the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and you've got sons who lost fathers in Uhud. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who wanted to go fight in Uhud and leave his father back in Uhud to take care of the family, but his father insisted otherwise. So Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu feeling guilt that my father was martyred, I should have been there instead. You have Sa'd ibn Khaythama and Khaythama, a father and a son who drew lots the day before Badr. One of them you know, and, and the son says that I would have given you what you wanted had it not been Jannah that we're seeking. And then he, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, gets to go. He's martyred in Badr. Khaythama lives with sadness until Uhud. Why is it that my son was lost in Badr until Uhud comes? And then Khaythama radiallahu anhu is martyred in Uhud. Imagine the son martyred in Badr, the father martyred in Uhud. But he was carrying a sadness. Jabir, Mima araka munkasiran. Seemed broken, but he carried that moment of Uhud for the rest of his life. What about those who felt guilty because they knew they inflicted? Can you imagine being one of the 40 companions who came down from the mountain? Let me ask you all this question. Can anyone name one of the 40 Sahaba? We know the story of Uhud. 40 of the 50 disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ, came down from 
Jabir Ruma, against the orders of the Prophet because they thought the battle was over. That's essentially what left them exposed. Can any one of you name one of those companions? Anyone? Neither can I. <laughs> I can't. Because the Sahaba did sitr. They concealed. SubhanAllah, imagine. If my father was killed in Uhud because of you, because of you, you 40, do you see a single narration like that? Or suddenly the Sahaba go and they start beating up the families or they say, you know, you inflicted this pain on me, so I'm going to inflict this pain on you. No, because they had that understanding of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this was what Allah had decreed for my father. This is what Allah decreed for my brother. This is what Allah decreed for my son. This was going to happen. But imagine being one of those 40 carrying that guilt. Now Allah Azzawajal forgave them. The Prophet Sallallahu forgave them. They were reintegrated into the community. They weren't munafiqeen. They weren't hypocrites. They got weak for a moment. But that moment was very consequential, wasn't it? So imagine being one of the 40 and then being one of the family members of the 73 martyrs or 72 martyrs of Uhud. Looking at those 40, saying, you did this. That didn't happen. Because that's where the understanding that yes, guilt is a natural emotion and we have to recalibrate and get better with the circumstances that we have. But at the same time, Allah Azza wa Jal has promised everyone a customized path to paradise. I want to end on this note because I think subhanAllah it's always what we come back to. When we think of the difficulty that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had in regards to us, we see people suffer in enormous ways today. The Prophet Sallallahu suffered in every way. And he is the best of Allah's creation. And there is a guilt that some of the good things, SubhanAllah, the one who is muhib, the one who loves the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in their moments of happiness will remember that the Prophet Sallallahu did not have some of those moments in this dunya. Aisha radiallahu anha would cry, right? Because she would say, you know, when food was in her house, I remember we used to go months without food in our house. Now the Prophet is not here anymore and there's food here. There's something to be said about this. That even in our moments of our greatest joy, we remember that the best of Allah's creation did not get to experience all of that in this dunya. And we hope that that activates us towards experiencing that joy with the Prophet in the Akhirah. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was with the Prophet sallallahu in Fatih Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had one family member that took a very, very, very long time embracing Islam. He's the only companion radiallahu anhu whose entire family embraced Islam. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Every generation of his family embraced Islam. He's the only one in that regard. But who was the last person to embrace Islam from his family? His father. His father. Abi Quhafa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His father was the last person to embrace Islam. And it was all the way at Fatih Mecca. The last years, subhanAllah, the very last moments. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi comes on that day of Mecca. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu brings his father Abi Quhafa and he was all gray. Everything was gray. There wasn't a single thing on him not gray. He could barely move. He was so old. As if Allah Azzawajal delayed him to that moment for the pleasure of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Abu Bakr would see every single member of his family embrace Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ even says, لَوْ أَكْرَمْتَ الشَّيْخَ وَأَتَيْنَاهُ You know, if you would have honored the old man, we would have went to him. Like, don't even bring him to give bay'ah to me. The Prophet ﷺ is saying to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, I would have gone to his house. You didn't even have to make your father make this trip to come and give bay'ah, to come and pledge to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So imagine Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is supposed to be the happiest moment of his life. He's been waiting for his father to embrace Islam. And his father can barely extend his hand to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to take bay'ah. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu starts to weep. Now SubhanAllah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr knows him, right? He knows that that's not a happy cry. That's not the cry of joy. That was the cry of the hizra. This is the cry of sadness. So the Prophet ﷺ asks him, why are you crying, Ya Abu Bakr? What is it that's making you cry right now? And Ibn Hajar, rahimallah, he narrates this in his isaba. He says, 
that Abu Bakr said to the Prophet ﷺ, if only it could have been the hand of your uncle in the place of my father's. The hand of your uncle in the place of my father's. وَيُسْلِمْ وَيُقِرُّ اللَّهُ عَيْنَكَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ أَنْ يَكُونَ if it would have been your uncle, Ya Rasulullah, who was like your father, Abu Talib was like a father to the Prophet who could have been here in this moment, and you could have been taking the bay'ah from your uncle, Abu Talib, while he's saying, La ilaha illallah, and Allah giving you the coolness of your eyes, Ya Rasulullah, and seeing this moment, enjoying this moment with your father, someone who was like a father figure to you. He said, that would be so much more beloved to me than my own father's hand being in your hands. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful heart. So it's not just death and mutilation. It's even when Allah blesses us with our moments of purest joy that we remember that our Messenger وسلم, did not get to taste the sweetness of all of that in this dunya and that should cause all of us to long for Jannah more. And that is the end of this that whether you're the persecuted or the one watching the persecuted, whether you're the deprived in this world or the one who is uh, blessed in this world with all sorts of things opening for you, that all of those things are meant to make you crave Jannah more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us with our brothers and sisters in Gaza, with the shuhada, and Allah azza wa jal accept us as shuhada and unite us with the prophets, with the anbiya, with the siddiqoon. ود الشهداء ود الصالحون وحسن أولئك رفيقا اللهم أمين وصلى الله وسلم بارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته